I'm going to hand it over to our first presenter who is Allison Thompson. So she's an Energy Futures Lab fellow and has been since the very beginning in 2015. Uh, she's also the chair of the Canadian Geothermal Energy Association, Kangia, and CEO of Borealis Power. So Allison, over to you and I will be advancing the slides for you. So just, just mention when you're ready and I'm happy to, to do that. Great, thank you, Erin. Can I get a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? You're a little light to me, but I'll just crank up my speaker. <laughs> I'll uh, keep my social distance from my colleague, Leah, <laughs> and Kenjia, but uh, I'm a, a fast talker and a loud talker, so I'm going to get through the eight minutes, uh, uh, I think, in, in a fun way. So my favorite topic, why geothermal? Uh, we are a little bit different than the other renewables. Uh, some takeaways for today would be that we are what we'll call base load. We run all the time, 24-7. And uh, you may have heard the word intermittent. Intermittent usually refers to some of the other renewables such as run a river, wind and solar. So when you have something that's renewable and it's baseload running all the time, and you couple that with uh, reservoirs that there's at least three worldwide now that have operated continuously for more than 50 years, what you're able to do is uh, be certain of long-term revenue. And this is really important for economic modeling. Something else of the differentiation with geothermal and other fuels, be them again uh, fossil fuel based or renewables, is we have an incredibly small footprint compared to hydro, uh, coal plants, uh, nuclear, uh, wind, solar. Why is this important? Uh, for permitting. And uh, if you have to permit a smaller piece of land, uh, you're usually able to get through community referrals much more easily and as well. Uh, it just is more appealing for the community to have something with, with a small footprint. So if you're familiar with a, a SAG D sized uh, drilling pad, uh, you can think about that as, um, as a geothermal analog. So you have mines in oil sands and then the SAG D way of, uh, of harvesting oil sands. Geothermal is more on the, uh, the SAG D side of footprint versus a mine. I think what might be surprising to people though is how mature the industry is. Geothermal traces its roots over 200 years ago, which actually predates modern oil and gas. And the, uh, the industry got its start in Italy with commercial operations. And so quotes that you'll hear from some of the geothermal leaders around the world are, is that there's a wholesale transferability of skill sets, so literally one-to-one -one from the oil and gas industry to geothermal. And we have traded techniques back and forth over the decades. Uh, when their industry is down, usually our industry takes off. And that's because drilling rigs become more available and they become less expensive to procure. So this economic crisis is actually economic opportunity for the geothermal industry. And before we get too far ahead of ourselves, what needs to be stated is the most importantly is that Canada, especially Western Canada and Northern Canada and right here in Alberta, we have the resource. Uh, you can't play unless you have what Mother Nature has provided you, and uh, we're very fortunate to have that. So let's move on, Erin. So moving into what is geothermal, I, I think most of this is, is familiar to people that the, the deeper that you drill, the hotter it gets. The surface of the sun is actually a, a lower temperature than the center of our Earth. Uh, yes, our uh, heat source is radiogenic, which means that there's some decay going on in that center of the Earth and uh, the heat emanates up through the rock layers and is able to be concentrated or pools and reservoirs, but we don't have to worry about the heat running out. And so that, uh, that sometimes is um, a little bit of a myth buster that some detractors in the industry like to say is that geothermal will run out. Uh, we're not gonna run out in, in certainly our lifetime or the lifetime of the earth. Uh, let's move on, Aaron. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides. It, it's actually over 20 years old. It's something that um, the education group in the United States put out. Uh, and it was actually for education purposes for schools. And what you have here is where imagination meets engineering and geoscientists. So we like to call this imagineering. Uh, all forms of energy are useful, uh, geothermal in particular, because it's a heat energy at the lowest levels, you're able to do very useful things for Canadians, such as, as snow melting without a lot of uh, technical um, difficulty. Uh, all the way up though, with higher temperature uses, you can do the most technologically demanding thing, which is make power or electricity. So everything in between is available with the use of geothermal heat. 
And so I encourage everyone to spend some time later on in the replay to, to have a look at this slide and to also be inspired about what would you do if you had a small footprint, non-emitting, copious, renewable, baseload, always available energy form to you. And, and this is really what is, is the, the biggest differentiator for geothermal energy. Moving on, Erin. So where is it? This uh, Energy Futures Lab is, uh, is about the Alberta opportunity. Uh, Alberta has many different types of the geothermal resource. So starting in the Rocky Mountains, you have more of the hot spring style geothermal resource. That's uh, traditionally more of the hot, wet rock. Uh, those are the mountain towns such as Banff and Jasper, Canmore, uh, Grand Cache, uh, going down to Crow's Nest Pass. Uh, these are the types of geothermal resources that are, are typically more traditional, more, more like the ones that have been developed over the past 100 years or so. What you have now moving though into the foothills and the prairies is what we're going to specialize in in Alberta, which is the hot sedimentary aquifer. Uh, very fortunate for us, the oil and gas industry, which has been active here for 100 years, has literally found, mapped, sampled, tested, measured, flowed, uh, all the geothermal resources that we'd like to now use to make both heat projects or district cooling projects or electricity projects. And because geoscientists and engineers uh, typically aren't content just with what Mother Nature provides, what you can do is have engineered or enhanced geothermal systems to extract even more heat energy out of those hot sedimentary aquifers. That same style of technique, the EGS, Enhanced Geothermal Systems, can also be used in harder rock or granite. We also have that in Alberta and, of course, moving into the Canadian Shield. But most of the presentation today between myself and Sean will focus on the hot sedimentary aquifer opportunity. Thanks, Erin. And so this is what a, uh, a comprehensive view of a geothermal project may look like. Uh, the caveat here is, is that given the heat available, uh, the same type of heat can come off of a coal plant or a nuclear plant. The differentiation here though for geothermal is that because of uh, some of the limitations in public safety associated with uh, the other fuel sources, is it's very difficult to actually co-locate or cascade operations. Because geothermal is so benign, uh, industries that would like to cascade the use of heat are able to get up and close and personal to geothermal. And so that's why we take ownership of this diagram, the, the cascaded approach. So if you're lucky enough to be using a, a reservoir that is high enough, uh, hot enough to make electricity, you may start with that application. Moving down the, the technical value chain, you may do absorption chilling, which results in refrigeration. Moving down into district heating, uh, possibly the higher temperature industrial heat, which is typically a, a baseload activity, such as a, a pulp and paper mill or, uh, or lumber drawing, and then moving down into commercial and residential opportunities for district heating. Thanks, Erin. And I'm gonna turn it over for just a, a brief comment from my colleague, Leanne, from the Canadian Geothermal Energy Association to point you to some other resources that are available after this webinar. Um, so I'll try to do it from here. I'm just doing a really quick overview. Um, so what you see here is a recently published handbook that Kangia, the Canadian Geothermal Energy Association did. Um, it was done through the government of Alberta as well as Energy Efficiency Alberta. And the point of this is to kind of inform and help people learn as, far, as well as educate. Um, the target is to have an accessible and comprehensive geothermal project development handbook for companies and municipalities to look at for reference and to learn from. Um, Aaron, you go next. And then there was just a picture on this slide as well, just showing some of the other reports that Kangia has published as well. What our reports are for is to help our members and our supporters to learn. So one of the main ones that I did have as an image on the original slide deck was just an introduction to Canada's geothermal development and the Canadian policy gap. So the point of this is to outline and define the gaps in policy and the gaps in development within Canada and how to address these. So the whole point of what we're trying to do is address these barriers and outline the benefits for people to learn. Um, and all of these reports are available at that website there as well. And then the handbook from the last page, we have just started a series roll-up for our members, and that did just start yesterday. We've asked Allison Thompson to share a bit about like what geothermal is and then a little bit about her project. And we've asked Sean Collins, who is another Energy Futures Lab fellow and has been since the very beginning in 2015, to share a bit more about the, um, the opportunities, the economic opportunities. And so with that, I will hand it over to Sean Collins, who is the president of Terrapin Geothermics, and he can share more about what that is. Uh, perfect. Um, 
and 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 that's where I wanted to frame out some of the points that I think Allison made that are that are really valuable that I want to touch on fairly quickly. Um, that that may for people who are just learning about geothermal pass by fairly quickly, but are pretty important to the overall concepts. Um, I think some of the most important stuff that Allison really focused on was the thinking about the cascade use of geothermal heat and power. That's probably the thing that folks in geothermal spend the most of their time trying to educate on is that a lot of people just see geother geothermal through the lens of its ability to generate power production. Um, but in Canada, that's somewhat difficult, whereas there's really significant economics in the heat use side of things. And particularly if you can have a project where you have electricity revenue at the front because you have a high temperature resource, but then you're making money down the line. So usually you can only generate power down to call it 85 degrees Celsius. Um, but if you have two or 300 liters a second of flow rate, um, at those temperatures, there's a really significant amount of energy in that. And you can usually generate about three or four times the carbon offsets on the heat utilization side as you can on the power production side. Um, so, so some of that I think was really important context uh, and that shouldn't be thought of separately um, because when you really get into the weeds of geothermal business models and projects that have succeeded globally, they do a lot of the things that Allison is talking about where you, you get a high temperature resource, you produce power and you also sell the heat. Um, and so I just want to make sure that's not lost on anyone because that's fairly key information. Um, so, so I'll do maybe five seconds of background on, on me and Terrapin, uh, and then Aaron and the team sort of asked us to talk about a bit more about the specific, um, the job side of it, the economic opportunity and the sort of job creation side of it. So people can get a bit more nuanced sense of where specifically do the jobs in geothermal show up. And, and so, so I just have a few sort of quick slides here. Um, and then I'm really interested to, uh, to jump into Q and A. Um, but the, the big opportunity I've always seen in geothermal and one of the main reasons I wanted to start a geothermal development company about four years ago, um, was the fact that it is a natural fit for hydrocarbon bearing industries. I grew up in Fort McMurray, Alberta. Uh, a lot of my friends have sort of grown up throughout the oil and gas industry. And my perception on it is that Alberta is in the business of lifting fluids to the surface and geothermal is lifting fluids to the surface. Um, and so it's a very natural fit where it's not retraining, it's not retooling, it's not, it's, it's essentially drilling, Allison framed it, it's kind of variations on SAG-D wells um, that are very deep and expensive. And, and in a moment in time where wells are now much more affordable, uh, the economics of the whole category shift fairly significantly. And so we, in, in these slides, um, there's lots of different numbers you could pick for what the sort of size of the prize is, but this is partially based on some of Kangia's work, on some of ASO's work. They're sort of general estimates of what the viable power production at current economics, at current sort of resource estimates are. This is a, a shot in the dark, but we're just picking it. Um, there is ASO, so the Alberta Electrical Systems Operator, so the electricity grid in Alberta, they projected that there's between three and 500 megawatts of geothermal of it potential in the long-term forecast. So if you use that number, um, in general, we think 300 megawatts of geothermal would create an economic opp opportunity of about $3 billion within the province. Um, and do you wanna to go to the next slide, Aaron? And, and, and of that, um, and this is where uh, I sort of get down into the bottom just on where those jobs show up. Um, and you can sort of see in geothermal, you're essentially drilling and then there's a significant amount of heat exchanger and piping networks and a power plant. And the power plant itself is, is, a, is a similar to, it's a different technology, but it's similar to steam-based power plants that you would see in coal facilities or natural gas facilities. Um, but the, I think the important thing right now, especially in this context, is some of the job opportunities. And you can see specifically in drilling, downhole, geochemistry, all, all of the things you need in oil and gas to drill for that resource, you, you need very similar things within geothermal. Um, and it, it tends to be deeper, larger uh, systems than you're going to find within oil and gas. Uh, do you want to go to the next one, Erin? Um, and so, so if we do that, if we had a, a geothermal industry of that size, theoretically, um, you would be in the ballpark of drilling 200 wells across Western Canada, um, which would result in, in sort of, again, these are napkin math estimates at this point, but sort of in the ballpark of seven to 8,000 drilling days worth of uh, service requirement. 
And we found this out. So we found this out recently that with the recent downturn, it looks like Alberta is going to be short about eight to 10,000 grilling days worth of work um, in, in the province over the next year. Um, and so there's sort of a, a message to be made of this is sort of a perfect opportunity to pick up that slack um, that won't exist from a capitalistic perspective within oil and gas right now. Um, and, and, and again, this is the message that you're, you're deeper, longer drilling timelines than you are in oil and gas. And so it's a perfect moment in time to focus on that instead of a $3 a barrel resource right now. Um, okay, Aaron, do you want to go to the next one? Uh, I, this is not as sophisticated as the slide that uh, Allison would have shared, but again, um, sort of the, the map that she showed of the volcanic, volcanic resource potential within certain parts of the mountain ranges into the hot sedimentary aquifer systems. Um, we as a company are only focused on hot sedimentary aquifer projects. Um, and in general, the west, northwest part of the province is where you have the best resource. Um, almost every project that's been discussed or brainstormed in some way, shape or form in Alberta is within one of these regions. And, and I've gotten asked this question before of, could you see a day where geothermal is the dominant heat and power source in Alberta? And I don't think so. I don't think it's something that makes sense in the whole east and parts of the south part of the province. Um, and so it's not a silver bullet solution, but it's a very intelligent solution, particularly in the northwest part of the province where you have significant industrial facilities because you can produce power and then you can provide that heat input to those industrial facilities. So instead of your boiler pre-feed heat coming from combusting natural gas, that could come from a geothermal heat source. Um, and so this is a bit of a visual map on where in the province some of the best opportunities lie. And then I think I've got a summary slide there, Aaron. Um, so, so just in general, this is a bit of the message that we're trying to carry is that this, is, this isn't hundreds and hundreds of thousands of jobs tomorrow, but this is a real meaningful opportunity for um, diversification, sort of refocusing of our, our um, workforce and proof of a new baseload renewable resource. And, and the thing that's always struck me about geothermal is it is the only baseload renewable source of heat in the world. There are baseload renewables, there's, there's baseload power generation that's renewable, there, there's lots of, of different technologies and energy sources and types. But if we're to think about a net zero greenhouse gas energy system in 2050, geothermal has to make up a part of that. Um, and, and otherwise you need heat storage of some sort. Uh, and that's very difficult. And so we, uh, we've made our decisions and drank the Kool-Aid, but we see a very long-term opportunity because eventually systems have to solve for baseload renewable heat. Uh, 